Well, good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to be with you once again today. Do me a favor, take your Bibles and open them to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we're going to start in verse 44 today as we continue, and we're looking at parables together as we have been doing the last few weeks in a series called Kingdom Stories, talking about that, that unique method of teaching employed by Christ where he's using stories with everyday examples to make clear, make plain a truth. But he's not trying to make it plain to just anybody. He's making it plain to those whose hearts are seeking him. Anybody seeking the Lord in here today? Amen. Amen. Well, he's got something for you today. Christ also had a dual purpose in that he was using these stories to hide truth from those who were not seeking the Lord, from those who are in fact rejecting him. And we've talked about a number of these types of stories, these kingdom stories, because there is a kingdom coming, amen? Jesus Christ is coming back. You believe that? And when he does, he's going to rule and reign in person, and we're going to be there for that, we who are the children of God. Uh, but that, ki- that age is not the age that we're in right now. His kingdom is not literal and physical on the earth right now, but this is an age in which the church exists to provide a glimpse into that coming kingdom. And that's really what these parables that we've been studying have been all about. And we've looked at a number of them, and we're going to look at two more today. And uh, the parables that we're going to look at today are quite short. In fact, they only cover about three verses in Matthew 13. And if you read them in tandem, you might conclude that they, they essentially tell the same story. And a lot of people think that about these two particular parables. They think, well, they're they're just so similar. They must be talking about the same theme. They must be talking about the same truth. Uh, You know, because one of them uh, speaks of a man who finds uh, something of value. In fact, they both talk about a person who comes upon something of great value, and then he, he does something very sacrificial. He sells everything he has in order to obtain this item of great value. And in the first parable we're going to look at, that item is referred to as a hidden treasure. And in the second parable, it's referred to as a, as a pearl of great price. And some people think, well, ah, treasure, pearl, potato, potato, what's the same? It's, it's, it's something of value, and he's going to buy it. That's the idea. These are the same story told in two different ways. Well, you know, I'm reminded of a story I heard recently about an old man. And this old man, he'd lost some of his faculties, and he was driving along one day, and he committed an error in driving, and he, he ran into the back of a very expensive and exotic sports car. And the driver of this car, he hopped out, and I mean, he was irate. He, he went back there fuming, and he started to berate this old man through the window of the car. He says, you old fool, look what you've done to my car. Now you get out, and you give me $10,000 right now, or I'm going to beat you to a pulp. And that old man said, oh my, well, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have that kind of money. He said, I'll tell you what, let me call my son. He's a dolphin trainer. He'll know what to do. And the guy's thinking, dolphin trainer? And so he dials up his son. And when his son answers the phone, the angry driver snatches that phone away from him. And he says, listen here, Mr. Dolphin Trainer. Uh, Look, you better get down here. Your dad is really messed up. And if you don't bring me $10,000, I'm going to beat your father and you to a pulp. You got that, flipper boy? (laughs) And the voice on the other end of the line calmly responded, said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. The son pulls up a short time later, gets out of the car, walks over to the angry driver and proceeds to pummel him to the ground. He then walks over to the old man. He says, Dad, for the last time, SEALs, I train Navy SEALs. (laughs) Now that old man may have thought, eh, dolphin, SEAL. Yeah, they're both marine mammals, potato, potato, you know? It's all the same, but words matter and context matters, and so we don't want to make assumptions, especially when it comes to God's Word, amen? And so we're going to look at this, and we're going to go deeper here, and we're going to see that there is, in fact, a a very important distinction between these two parables, uh, the one of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, and it's going to shed light on an aspect of that coming kingdom. 
Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon our time and your word today, the adventure that we're about to embark on, God. And I pray that you'll grant us clarity and illumination and show us what we need to know about the promise of your kingdom and what impact that should have on us right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Protestantism had become quite a smorgasbord. Is that how you say that? Smorgasbord? You got to sound like the Swedish chef a little bit, you know. Ordy dordy board. You know? The <laughs> point is, lots of options are out there. You can find any brand of Christianity that you want. Now, it wasn't always that way for centuries. The only, the only uh, option out there was the Roman Catholic Church from the Middle Ages on, right? I mean, that, that was essentially it. And what that meant was everybody believed the same creeds. Uh, we had one church, one pope, one city, one faith. All of that. Now, something happened in the 1500s called the Protestant Reformation. And I think that's one of the most important events of all time. It was necessary. It was necessary for us to break away from the Roman Catholic Church. We needed to return to authority under the word of God, not under human rule. We needed to grasp some important doctrinal concepts, justification by faith, by grace, through Christ, all of these things, but one result of the Protestant Reformation was there would now be a splintering. There would now be a fracturing. People would not all be unified by one mother church. We would now go out and there would be denominations that would arise. There would be different factions, different groups, different leaders of different types of flocks. Options, And that, that falls in nicely with our uh, American line of thinking here in the States. We, we like to have choice, right? We like to, today some of you may go to lunch and you're going to choose from any, any bevy of options about the 300 million restaurants we have here in Burlington. And uh, we like that, and people like that when it comes to their religion. And so what has emerged is really a, a group of different tribes. We've all kind of picked our team. And in the middle, of, or in the early 1900s, there was a theologian who observed this, and he's looking around at all of the churches in the Western Hemisphere, and he sees churches where the rich guys go, and he sees churches where the poor people go, and he sees churches where the black folks go, and where the white folks go, and we're all divided up. And he said, you know, here in the 20th century, you basically can pick a church that is like you. You could pick a church that has as little infringement on you as possible. And he said, I'm afraid that we have removed the, the prophetic voice of the gospel. <laughs> Meaning that in a world filled with, with bigotry and cruelty and coldness, where we are already divided, the one place where we ought not be divided is in the church. Not that we should come and just not talk about important stuff that we might disagree on and avoid conflict for the sake of unity, but that under the banner of Jesus Christ, where we are all under the authority of his word, it is that and, and his spirit that unifies us, but that is not what he was seeing in the church. And he says, we've been undermined by a consumeristic attitude, and we all seek that which makes us happy. And we're divided. And now the church has become little more than just one other organization to be put on the shelf with the, the Lions Club and the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club and the Masons and the Little League. What does Jesus want? Well, in John 13, 35, he says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples and that you have love for one another. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, and above all, put on love which binds everything together. These words of togetherness and, and, and harmony, you see. Christ says in John 10, 16, he says to the Jews, his followers, I have sheep of another flock, and I must bring them also. They'll listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Do we see that perfectly right now? Not all the time. Will we see it? Oh, yes. One day we will see it. We will see it in the kingdom. But that's what all these parables have been about. When we talked about the very first parable in Matthew 13, the parable of the sower, we said that was the proclamation of the kingdom. Meaning, in that church age that was to come, in which we now reside, the gospel's going to go out and it's going to be planted like seeds 
into hearts. And it's going to begin to take root. And the kingdom would be proclaimed. But then we read another parable, parable of the weeds, of the wheat and the tares. And we said that was the impersonation of the kingdom. Because as those seeds get planted, there are going to be hearts that are authentic, but there are going to be other hearts that only appear to have let that seed take root. And they're going to be imposters. They're going to be frauds that will infiltrate uh, God's people. And then we read the parable of the mustard seed, which we said represented the expansion of the kingdom. How Christianity is like the smallest of all seeds, the mustard seed. But once it's planted, it can grow and it becomes in that parable a massive tree in which birds find refuge and, and beasts come and they find shade and, 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 and creatures are sustained by the fruit of that tree. And we said as Christianity would expand, it would be of great benefit to all the nations of the world. Even if they didn't convert to Christ, they're going to they're gonna reap a benefit from the precepts and the principles and the philosophy found within Christianity. And then we read after that the parable of the leaven. And and we pointed out how leaven in, in the Bible is representative of sin. And how like when you put leaven or yeast within a lump of dough, it permeates that entire lump. And we've got to guard against that because this represents the potential corruption of the kingdom. Because sometimes the church fails. Sometimes the church falls down in its duties and we don't teach truth. And, and we get wishy-washy and we become like the world. And when we do, the world grows even darker. And so now we're going to see two more parables today. And, and as they are read together, they represent something as well. In your notes, Matthew 13, 44 through 46 is about the unity of the kingdom in the church age. There is to be a unity. There is not to be division according to God's design. Because in God's kingdom, all people are reconciled. Those who come by faith are reconciled not only to God, we're reconciled to each other. We need to be reconciled to each other. If you'd been there at the foot of Jesus' cross when he was dying for our sins, in that same place, you, you would have seen the wealthy. You would have seen Nicodemus Joseph of Arimathea, and then you would have seen the poor. You would have seen the lowly. You would have seen Mary Magdalene. You would have seen some humble fishermen. You would have seen uh, those in authority, those who were reputable. You would have seen a Roman soldier who was tasked with, with being the executioner that day. You would have also seen a thief on the cross. And what did those two polar opposites have in common? On that day, in that moment, they would both trust Christ as their Savior. And you would see people visit the tomb of Christ. You would see the affluent. You would see the mighty. You would see the mundane. You would see the lowly. And what is it that brings them together? It is Jesus. Can people who are radically different from one another come together to fellowship? They can. It is only through Jesus Christ. And some look at the church today and they say, not possible. We're too divided. This church doesn't look anything like that church. And they see us squabbling with one another. And they don't think that we have anything in common. They don't see unity. But how does God... Jesus see his kingdom. Let's look at these two parables. And I want to show you the distance that God covers in unifying people under the banner of his kingdom. The first parable that we're going to look at is the parable of the hidden treasure. And it starts this way in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Now people wrestle with symbols in these parables. You know, when, when, sometimes Jesus tells you exactly what everything means, sometimes he doesn't. And when he doesn't, people kind of haggle over what those symbols mean. And there are a lot of takes on this particular parable. Let me give you what I think is the best in context interpretation of what the treasure is in this parable, okay? In your notes, the hidden treasure represents a faithful Israel. A faithful Israel. Let me ask you is Israel a treasure? It is to God. It is to God. Exodus 19.5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. The words of the Lord, they are a treasure. Uh, Psalm 135.4, For the Lord has chosen Jacob. Remember Jacob? Uh, descended from Abraham, son to Isaac, people of the covenant, one of the patriarchs. What did God change his name to? Israel. He says, Jacob has been chosen, Israel, as his own possession. His own possession in the Hebrew is literally his special treasure. 
Who were the sons of Jacob? He had 12 of them. Uh, at least, well, he had more than 12, but there are 12 key sons. And those sons would go on to produce tribes. And there would be 12 historic tribes of Israel. And in Israel, the high priest would go into the temple and he wore a special garment. And on that garment, there was a, a, a chess piece, a square chess piece called an ephod. And on that ephod, there were 12 stones, precious jewels, each of them representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so God uses precious jewels like you might find in a treasure to, to signify, to symbolize his chosen people, his, his precious treasure, Israel. But this treasure in this parable is called a hidden treasure. What makes it a hidden treasure? Well, by the time of Christ, for 600 years, Israel had, in effect, been tucked away. They'd been hidden. They were not prominent on the world stage. At one point, they were. They had a king. They had a succession of kings. Uh, They started with three. They divided into two. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. That northern kingdom got taken into captivity by Assyria. That southern kingdom got taken into a captivity by the Babylonians. And when they finally were released and they came back to the land, from that point forward, they did not have any kings. They had no king. They were not prominent. They were not seen as sovereign. They were always, thenceforward, subjugated. They were under the thumb of different Gentile empires. In short, they were buried. They were buried. Like like this treasure is buried in this field. Now, what is this field? In your notes, the field represents the world. They represent, it represents the world. You see, Israel was submerged within the constraints of the world system. And even today, I submit to you that the world does not see value in Israel. The world looks down upon Israel. It's a tiny little nation. Israel is hated, Israel is maligned, Israel is blamed for a lot of things, but I'm not really talking about the geopolitical modern lines of the nation Israel Uh, today. We are talking about the chosen people of God, the chosen people of God, and in this parable, you have a man who discovers a treasure in a field, and he's so enthralled with this treasure, he covers it up. He covers it up. Now, how many of you, when you've gone to a store, uh, you, you're just walking those aisles and you, you stop and you see something on a shelf and you go, oh, and it's unique and it's the only one left. Now, you are not prepared to purchase that item. What do you do? Admit it. You tuck that thing way back up in there, don't you? Why? Because you're coming back. You're going to get your pocketbook or your credit card, and you're coming back, and you're going. But you're you're hiding it, you're saving it for later. Well, this man covers up this treasure. He's not he's not prepared at that moment to purchase the, to to dig that thing up. He's going to come back. And so, what does he do? We shall see. But who is this man who delights in this buried treasure? In your notes, the man who finds this treasure represents Christ. This is Christ. This is Israel's Messiah. In fact, that's what Christ means. Christ is not Jesus' last name, you know. Christ is a Greek term that means Messiah. He's the Christ. What identifies this man as Jesus? His actions. Take a look at what he does. It says that then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. What does that mean? In his joy, he sells all he has. What did Christ have that he gave away? He had the riches of glory. He stepped out of heaven and the majesty of heaven. He humbled himself, came down here, and he went to the cross for us. Paul writes in Philippians 2.5 that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He gave it all. He gave it all. He sold all he had. The man in this parable, this wealthy man, goes broke to obtain this treasure. Jesus Christ forsook the riches of glory and of heaven to pay the ultimate price and one prime reason that he came into this world was to redeem his people he is the messiah 
you understand. Some say, well, no, no, he died for the church when he went to Calvary. He died on that cross for the church. Uh, that is a limited view. And if, if you say that it was limited to the church, I say hogwash. He died for the world. He died for all. And, the, and part of the world was Israel. You cannot separate Israel's Messiah from Israel, you understand. The fact that his name is Jesus Christ means that his reason for coming involved, to an important degree, the redemption of his people. The concept of Messiah is central to Israel. You cannot disassociate Jesus from Israel. And this man goes from wealthy to destitute in order to obtain this treasure. Jesus Christ is going to pour out his life. But I want you to notice that when he comes back, he doesn't just come back under cover of night, dig up that treasure and leave. What does he do? He buys a whole field. What is that field? I've already, uh, I've already told you that he is Christ, but what he does here is, is he, uh, he does what 1 John says. It says that he is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. The whole world. The, the field is the world. He bought the whole field. Aren't you glad he bought the whole field? All you Gentiles, are you glad about that? I'm glad about that. And so that is our first parable, that there's a treasure, Israel. It's hidden in a field. That is the world system. This man, Christ, he comes. He delights in that treasure, gives all he has. He dies on the cross for the whole field, the whole world, to get to Israel, to purchase them. But he's not just going to die for them. John 3, 16, he loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. All right? That's parable number one. Let's start this second parable. You're like, man, Pastor Scott, you're moving a lot quicker today. I hope so. All right. Parable of the pearl is what we call this. And here's how it reads. And I want you to see that it starts with the word again. Again. So that means there's a connection here. Uh, these parables are not identical, but there is a connection. He says again in verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. In search of fine pearls. So the first parable spoke of a man. This one talks about a merchant. Uh, he is a merchant that seeks after pearls. And so immediately we have a difference in these parables, right? They both feature something valuable. They both feature a treasure of sorts. In the first parable, that treasure comes from the land. It's buried in a field. Where do pearls come from? They come from the sea, don't they? They're not land-born. They're from the sea. Now, what is the pearl in this verse? Well, in your notes, the pearl represents the faithful Gentile. That's the faithful Gentile. On that ephod, worn by the high priest, that chest piece with those precious jewels there, you know what you would not find among those precious jewels? You would not find a pearl. You would not find a pearl. You know why? Because pearls come from oysters. And an oyster to a Jew is nasty. All right? That is unclean. They are disgusting. They're like little vacuum cleaners at the bottom of the ocean. They're, they, are, they are grody, okay? They're like shrimp and catfish. Blech. <laughs> I love shrimp and catfish. <laughs> are you guys glad we're not under the law here in North Carolina? Yeah, me too. Now, when it comes to oysters, I could take oysters if, in, if they're in some sort of Cajun soup concoction or something like that. I'm not big on just slurping them up out of the shell, you know? That's just me. Maybe you enjoy that little Tabasco sauce, perhaps, but I'm just not into giant boogers. That's not my thing. You understand? You know, to each his own. Um, but the priest would not have a pearl on their garment. And pearls represent the Gentile, which means this represents the church, because the church would be comprised primarily of Gentiles, and those are unclean at this time to Israel. And this is a lot of what we addressed when we studied the book of Ephesians. We talked about God uniting clean and unclean. Jew and Gentile are one in his church. But there was this animosity. It was built in there. When Peter goes to preach to Cornelius and he encounters his Jewish believer friends, they're like, we heard that you ate with unclean men. And you want to shake our hand? You kidding me? And so that's what the pearl represents. Now, who is this merchant? I'll give you three guesses. 
It's the same as the man in the first parable. This is Christ in your notes. The merchant represents Christ. How do you know, Pastor Scott? What identifies this as Jesus? Once again, it's his actions. What does he do? Verse 46, this merchant who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. He does the exact same thing. He sells all he has. He gives up all of his rights the deed to his heavenly estate and the means of purchasing here is exactly the same as the first parable. He goes to extraordinary lengths, sacrificial lengths to buy this pearl. He's gonna die on the cross, not just for Israel, but for the whole world to purchase his church, his church. Now, what makes a pearl precious? What makes a pearl precious? You say, well, it's shiny, yeah, well, cubic zirconium is shiny, okay? What makes a pearl? Pre- Pearls are different from other precious stones. They don't come from the earth. They come from the sea. They're precious because they take a long time to form. Uh, and and they, they involve some significant sacrifice to obtain. I mean, to go get those things. That's a, a large undertaking. Here's why the pearl represents the church. We know why it represents the Gentile is because it comes from an oyster, which is considered unclean. Here's why it represents the church. It represents the church because pearls are formed as part of a living organism. You know how a pearl is formed? You you got a grain of sand. You got some kind of an irritant that is digging into the side of that oyster. It's wounding that oyster. It's causing injury to that oyster oyster but the oyster is alive and the oyster to heal itself will release fluid that will cover that irritant that will cover that grain of sand over and over and over until eventually a pearl is formed now listen my friends we're like that you and I are like that grain of sand we are coarse we are imperfect we are irritants And we have wounded Christ by our sin. But Christ has covered us. He has covered us with his grace and with his glory. And so thorough is that covering that he has created from that which is imperfect and harmful and irritating. He has made something priceless. He has made pearls of us. And through the payment of this price by which he would obtain us and all the world. God is going to draw through Jesus and through his spirit, he's gonna draw to himself his elect. Uh, Jesus says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. He says in John 10, 16, I have other sheep. I've read this before. I have other sheep, not of this flock and I gotta bring them also that they will listen to my voice so we will be one flock with one shepherd. And the order in which this salvation is granted is significant, okay? Uh, as Romans 1.16 says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. You see the order of these parables here? Who is featured in the first parable? Israel. That's who he came first to obtain. That's who he came first to purchase. And then this wonderful plan of redemption was opened up to not just the Jews. It was opened up to the rest of us. And so now his salvation comes to the Gentiles as well. And so this is referring really to that mystery that was not understood in the Old Testament. The church was not understood. You got glimpses of it. You got hints of it. You got little uh, muffled echoes of it. But nobody saw it coming. Nobody understood it. And here in these parables, Christ alludes to it. And it's going to be revealed. It's the mystery of the church. It's going to be proclaimed in this age. It's going to be impersonated in this age. It's going to expand in this age. It's going to undergo threat of corruption in this age. But now, in your notes, it's going to do something, this kingdom, that no other kingdom in history could do. It's going to unite natural enemies in one body in one body. Those who by rights should have nothing to do with each other. They have nothing in common. They hate one another. 
They are uh, predisposed against each other. Within this kingdom, they're going to come together in one body. We're going to be citizens together. We're going to be family together. Uh, We're going to love each other. People will listen to the message of the gospel through the church, and they're going to look and see people that should not have anything to do with one another, and it's going to be amazing. They're going to hear this amazing message, and they're going to be amazed at the people delivering the message because of their unity. That's God's design. Psalm 133, behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Wherever you see diversity with unity, you see the signature statement of God. Now, I realize that word diversity has sort of been hijacked today, so bear with me, all right? I'm not talking about a mandated, quota-driven, check-the-box, virtue-signaling brand of diversity that you hear so much about today. It's much, much bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. I want you to look at God. Is there diversity in God? You look at his eternal uh, oneness, but within that Godhead, you've got three unique persons. Is there diversity there? There is, you've got Father, you've got Son, you've got Spirit. They've all got different roles, but in that Godhead, there is perfect unity. There's perfect accord, perfect subordination. And whenever you see unity and diversity together, there is God. There is God. Man doesn't know how to do that. We don't know how to unite uh, diversity and unity. We're not good at that. We're good at, at promoting what we call diversity, but we're not good at diversity within perfect unity. Only God can accomplish that through the Spirit. And where you see it perfectly, there is God. You see it in the universe. You see it in the cosmos. You see it in the family. We talked about that in Ephesians, the different roles of the family. The father loves and protects the wife. The wife submits to and respects the husband. The child obeys the parents. The parents love and protect the child. It's God's thing in marriage. It's God's thing in the family. You've got husband and wife, bride and groom, diversity and unity. It's God's thing in a nation. You've got the governors. You've got the governed. Amen? You've got uh, 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 the body. You have many parts. Is there diversity in your body? Can you do with your ear what you can do with your nose? You cannot. So you got different things with different functions and, and they would all be weird on their own, but they work together and one head over all, it's God's thing in biology. And ideally, when you look at the church, you see all of those things manifested. All those pictures where God's diversity and unity are perfected are to be found in the church. What does the Bible call the church? Calls it the body. <laughs> calls it God's holy nation, right? Calls it the bride, calls it the family of God, there is to be unity and diversity within the church. Ideally, when you walk into a church, you ought to be able to look around and everybody's ego has been checked at the door. When you walk into a church, you ought to see rich guys and poor guys and, 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 and smart guys and not so smart guys and you know this ethnic background and that ethnic background and 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 there's neither Jew nor Greek nor male nor female nor slave nor free all are one in Christ and the message that's about to be preached your heart ought to be prepared to hear that message because of what you've experienced between the front door and your seat right there the unity of the body I'll tell you something if this church right here has one reputation in this community you know what I want that to be Uh, not the best worship in the community, which, by the way, I think we do have. I love our worship team, and they do a fantastic job, but that's not what I want this church to be known for. You say, preaching the word. Hey, I'm gonna do the best I can. I'm gonna try to be a faithful steward, but you know what I really want the reputation of this church to be? Is that when people come in here, they are loved and they are welcomed into the community of Jesus Christ. I want there to be a spirit so sweet here that people say, I can't stay away from that Lamb's Chapel. That's what we ought to strive toward. And if you consider this church to be your family, then you have to take that seriously. How are people gonna feel welcome here? Is that my job? Is that our staff's job? Well, sure, but you know who else's job that is? That's you guys too. If this is your home, we gotta, we gotta exemplify unity here and we gotta love one another and we can't squabble over stuff, amen? We have a unity. What is it rooted in? Three things I want to put, for sure Christ, all of this pertains to him. Here are three 
things within Christ that our unity is rooted in, in your notes, first of all, it's rooted in the truth of God. The truth of God. That means that there is doctrine that unites us. There are core essential truths that we hold to that bring us together. Were we all lost at one point? That's right. Bible teaches that. All have sinned and fallen short. Were we able to help ourselves in that sin? No. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so we are, as children of God, that means that we were chosen before the foundation of the world and grace was granted to us through Christ by his substitutionary atonement on the cross. That is truth. That he shed his blood for us. And so that is the truth of God. Paul wrote to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. Verse 28, he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock. The flock, that's the body, the church, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he, Christ, obtained, that means purchased, like a treasure, like a pearl, with what? With his own blood. That is truth. That is the atonement. That is Calvary. Our unity is rooted in that. Secondly, our unity is rooted in the love of God. The love of God. We don't just believe, we belong. He loves us. We belong to him, we who come by faith. Jesus taught his disciples about the unity of the flock, of those who come by faith, that we ought to love one another because we are loved by God. He says in Matthew 18, 10, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Look, when Jesus refers to somebody as one of his little ones, that's a term of affection. That is divine ownership. They're my little ones, he says. He goes on to say, For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Don't you despise another child of God for any reason. That is someone that is loved of God. He loves them so much he has assigned an angel to them. If you're ever wondering what's the proof text for guardian angels, This is as close as I can find right here. Their angels in heaven see the face of my Father. I love them so much, I have assigned some of my best angels to them. Don't you harm one of them. They're precious to me. They are precious to me. Those those Gentiles to you Jewish fellows may look like oyster snot, okay, but they are precious in my sight. And so we are rooted in the love of God. And then third, we are rooted in the glory of God. In the glory of God. John 17, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is alone at this point. The disciples are supposed to be watching and praying. They're not, but he is praying. And what is he praying? That great high priestly prayer. He says in verse 20, I do not ask for these only. Talking about the disciples. I don't ask for just them, Father. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. In, in, in other words, these, these guys who at this very moment have fallen asleep, who are subpar in the eyes of the world, they are, they are fishermen, they are tax collectors, these guys are going to go forth and they're going to bring a message that's going to see people convert to faith in me. And my prayer is for them and for those who don't even exist yet. What is that prayer? He says that they may all be one. That they may all be one. How so? Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us and that the world may believe that you have sent me the glory, you see, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them, so that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Wow. Wow. Did Jesus pray in vain? Is that prayer gonna be answered? Would Jesus pray a prayer that would not be fulfilled? You might say, well, what that's talking about is the Holy Spirit, that we're going to be one because we're all indwelled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that we're going to be unified in the traditional sense. It's just this internal unity. Listen, we are, as children of God, every one of us indwelled by the same Spirit. Absolutely. But what is the practical outcome of that in this day? All right? If we are, do you believe that, that, that Jesus was praying that we would be one as he and the Father are one? If we're going to be one in his sight, should we not be one in our sight? 
That means there's no stratification of Christians in the church. They're, they're all, it's what Christ has made all of this. I and them, you and me. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the Father and the Son have the same divine essence, that they are uniquely one, that they, they are both God? Do you believe that? We all believe that? Okay. Do you believe that, that Christ, through his Spirit, indwells the heart of every believer? Is that true? Okay, so God and, and Christ share the same divinity, the same power, the same authority. Christ, through his spirit, indwells every believer. You believe that? You do. You really do now? You're not just saying that because you're in church? You really believe that? Okay, I'm just checking. I just wanted to make sure because if that's true, if we believe that, and Christ prayed that they may be one as we are one, then where should that be displayed most evidently in how we treat one another in the body. That we are aware of the glory that inhabits every single child of God. Doesn't mean that we don't disagree from time to time. Doesn't mean that we don't have conflict. But we recognize there's a dignity in every Christian that should be respected uh, by every believer. Let me, show you, let me show you the most beautiful picture that I can think of in the scripture about the lengths to which God would go to preserve unity within his kingdom. When you think of Jew and Gentile, and you think of the animosity between those peoples, when you think of the natural born enmity between them, going all the way back to, to, to the, the child of Hagar and the child of Sarah, Revelation 21, verse 1, we have a vision from John the Apostle. He has a vision. He has a vision of heaven. And the vision that he has comes at the end of the kingdom age. He is seeing a picture of what will transpire after that literal thousand year reign of Christ. Christ is going to come back. He's going to reign from Jerusalem for a millennium. And at the end of that is going to manifest what John sees in this vision. Here's how it unfolds. He says in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know what that is, the New Jerusalem? That's the capital city of heaven, is what that is. And this is the dwelling place of God. It's the dwelling place of Christ, of the Holy Spirit, of all the angels, and one day of every redeemed person who ever lived, every saint of God of all time, we're all gonna live there. And John gives us this astounding glimpse into the majesty of heaven, of that holy city. In verse 16 of Revelation 21, here's how he describes the city. Prepare to be a little wowed here, okay, you ready? He says, the city lies four square. Its length, the same as its width. There are actual dimensions to this city. Literal dimensions, its length the same as its width. He goes on, he says, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. You know what that means? This city is a perfect cube. Did, did you know that? The new Jerusalem appears to be a perfect cube. There are other theories, and some are like, well, maybe it's a pyramid. Well, at a minimum, its base is a square, but its dimensions are just astonishing. 12,000 stadia. Do you know how big that is? 1,500 miles. That means this city, it, the base is a perfect square. It may, for all we know, be a perfect cube. That means it is 1,500 miles wide, it is 1,500 miles long, and it is 1,500 miles tall. And it goes on and it describes it. It describes the wall of this city, that the wall measures 144 cubits. That's a 200-foot thick wall. John says it radiates with glorious light. In verse 18, he says the wall was built of jasper. The city, pure gold like clear glass. So pure was this gold you could see through it. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. And then he lists the jewels. And incidentally, the jewels, there are 12 of them, and they're the same jewels on that ephod of that priest in the temple in Israel. But in this wall, and this is what I want you to see, in this wall are 12 gates. There are 12 gates. Now, gates represent access. 
you pass through the gate and you have access. Who lives in that city? God the Father lives in that city. Everyone who resides therein is righteous. So all who are there have access. And these gates are there. How are they depicted? Look here in verse 12. It says it had a great high wall with 12 gates and the gates, at the gates were 12 angels and on the gates, this is what I want you to see, (laughs) were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. They were inscribed on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And so you've got these gates, and we cross-reference with Ezekiel. We see that, that you've got one side has the names uh, Levi, Judah, Reuben. On one side, it's got Joseph, Benjamin, Dan. On another, it's Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun. And on another, it's Naphtali, Asher, and Gad. Those were the sons of Jacob. Those were the 12 tribes of Israel. So you've got these gates signifying access to God and emblazoned, etched, memorialized on these gates are the names representing God's chosen people, Israel, the Jewish people through whom Messiah came. But I want you to know something else about these gates. What are they made of? In verse 21, it says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. 12 pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl A 1,500-mile-wide city, and the gate is made from one pearl. That's a big, stinking oyster. (laughs) Only God. Only God. But the point here is that these pearls represent Gentiles who come to faith. What do we call that? The church. You've got the names of Israel etched on the very gate, made from the substance that symbolizes the Gentile church of God. That's unity. That's unity. And this comes pictured in the heavenly city. You see, the kingdom age at that point has come to an end, but the kingdom goes on. It's an everlasting kingdom. And here's the thing. John is writing of the eternal kingdom. And so I want to say this as we wrap up here. Jesus represents the time in which, uh, Jesus rather through these parables presents the time in which we are living right now. And it's a time when true unity is made possible through the bond of Christ. Are we living that out? Are we living like we believe that? See, the same unity, get your arms around this, the same unity that we're going to have in that phase of the kingdom, when we enter into the new Jerusalem, when we can touch the face of God... When there's no more separation from us and him and, and from between us and one another in that glorious, perfect state that will last forever and ever and ever and ever, that unity, according to Christ, is possible in his church right now. Because we are indwelled as imperfect people by a perfect spirit. And that brings a unity that pleases Christ. So let us walk in that unity. You with me? Let's bow. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing upon our week. May we live live, live out our identity in Christ and be one as you and the Father are one. You and him and him and you and we and you and all together reflecting the glory of God. Help us to do this, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Scott Grimm, and we want to thank you for joining us as we reach, raise, and release genuine followers of Jesus Christ here at the Lamb's Chapel. Uh, If you want to know when a video drops or when we go live, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And send this video to someone who needs to hear it. And make sure you invite them to join you here with us live this week. We'll see you soon.